Well, today we're going to continue on in our series called Jesus Is. This morning we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus is grace. Jesus is grace. Last week we talked about the fact that Jesus is the point. And that we, we learned that from the beginning of time, from the time that God created Adam and Eve and, and throughout Scripture, everything points to Jesus. That all the Scriptures in the Old Testament point forward to Jesus. The prophets, they prophesied about Jesus. They foretold of the coming of Jesus. And everything in the New Testament, the Gospels, are literally the story of Jesus told from four different people and everything after the Gospels point back to the life and the teaching of Jesus. And we realized last week that the reality is this. Church is not the point. Church is not the point. Being a good person is not the point. Jesus is the point. Jesus is the point. Without Jesus, there is no church. Jesus is the and this morning, we're going to talk about probably the greatest attribute of Jesus. The greatest personality trait of Jesus. The, the one thing that encapsulates Jesus in his persona and in his essence is this small word called grace. Such a small word. Such a big impact. Such a small word with such a big impact this morning. And I want to talk to you about the simple fact that Jesus is grace. And one of the most amazing things that we discover about Jesus is this thing that we call grace. The problem is grace is one of those things that we struggle with. Grace is one of those things that we have a hard time with. Mainly because the reality of grace is that it's too good to be true. How in the world could this be free? We have a hard time accepting grace because many of us can't even define grace. We've heard that term grace. We, we, we know that it's in scripture, but we still have a hard time just defining what grace is. And if we can't qualify it, if we, if we can't define it, we in our human nature have a hard time accepting it. This morning we're going to talk about grace. And I want you to understand that as we talk this morning, grace is not a thing. Grace is not an ideology. It's not a theology. Grace is a person. And that person is Jesus. If you remove Jesus, you remove grace. You cannot have grace apart from the person of Jesus. Jesus is grace. And this morning... We're going to talk about that, and we're going to see what it looks like. Grace is mentioned throughout Scripture so many, many times, and we'll see some of that today. And what we have to realize this morning is simply this, is that grace is the foundation of our relationship with Jesus. Without grace, there's no relationship with Jesus. You understand that? Without grace, there's no relationship with Jesus. Grace is the foundation of our relationship with Jesus, and it's the essence of our salvation. Our salvation is all because of grace, and our salvation should be enveloped by grace, which means that our lives should become very gracious lives. Somebody say amen. It's the essence of our walk with Jesus. It's the essence of our walk with our Savior. Grace defined as simply what we call the unmerited divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration or their sanctification. Grace is something that we cannot earn. It's unmerited. So many other religions require us to earn our way into heaven. If you do this, if you do that, the number of your good deeds will determine where you sit in the kingdom. That's not so. With Jesus, it's all about grace. And grace, the cool thing about grace is you don't earn it. It's freely given. And that's what's so hard for so many people to accept or to understand. 
That's why so many people sit on the edge of, of this thing we call Christianity and they say, I want to, I want to, but what's it going to cost me? I'm here to tell you today, admission is free. Somebody's already paid the price. Somebody already paid the price. How many of you love free stuff? Don't lie. Everybody in this room loves free stuff. Don't be lying to me. I know. My favorite price is free 99 I love it when stuff is free. I don't even care what it is. If it's like one French fry for free, yeah, I'll take it right here. Bring that free French fry right here. I'm in. I love free stuff. We have this big store in America called Costco. Okay. It's a big, huge warehouse store where they sell everything in bulk. It's like a big wholesale store. And you walk in, and there's like tons of stuff everywhere on these big shelves. But the cool thing about Costco is they have free samples. Everybody say free. Free samples. Because they have like this whole food section where you can go. They like restaurants go and buy bulk food there, and, and it's awesome. And everywhere you walk in the store, there's like people at these little kiosks, these little stands, handing out free food. So that you can test drive before you buy. Somebody say amen. amen. You ever bought something and you cooked it and you ate it and it was like, God, I wish I wouldn't have bought that. You know what I'm talking about? Or you go to a restaurant and you look at the picture and it's like, yes! And they bring it out and it's like, what happened? That is not the hamburger in this menu. You know what I'm saying? Well, at Costco, you can walk up and you can test drive before you buy. And we loved it. It was like, Saturday be like family day at Costco. What are we doing for lunch? We're going to Costco, baby. Free 99. And we just walk around and we just take samples. It's free. It's free. It's good. Somebody say amen. amen. It's nothing better than good and free. There's nothing better than good and free. I mean, if it's bad and free, eh, keep it. But if it's good and free... Well, can I tell you this morning that Jesus isn't good. Jesus is great. And he's free. Amen. Amen? Why? Because of grace. Because of grace. Because of grace. Jesus illustrated grace throughout, throughout the Bible using, using these things we call parables. The parables are just stories that Jesus told to kind of allow people to relate to him. They may not understand it if he just comes out and, and simply explains it, but he used these things called parables to teach. They're stories that he told to teach people about himself or, or to teach people about kingdom principles. And we find in Luke chapter 15 this morning, there are several parables that Jesus tells, three to be distinct, and all of them talk about something that was lost, that was found. Many of you are familiar with, with these stories, and and we know that there's a story of, of lost things, a story of the lost sheep. There's a story of a lost coin. And then the story of the lost son. The cool thing about all these stories as you read them, the one thing that I want you to understand this morning, and we'll come right back to this in just a little bit, is that every time these things that were lost were found, there was a celebration. Anybody ever lost your keys? Yeah. Do you hate it when you lose your keys? Don't you love it when you find them? Yeah. It's like, woo, party. Everybody does a happy dance because you found your keys. You don't care if anybody's looking. Or maybe you, you lose the remote to the TV. That's a killer. Come on. Where is that remote? Or maybe the remote to the air conditioner. That's a booger too. Somebody help me find it. But we know what it's like to lose something. But we also know the joy in finding it once it's been lost. You know what I'm saying? And, uh. I remember, I'm going to tell on myself, is that cool? I remember the day I lost my wedding ring. Oh. I know. We were doing a building project at church, and we were building this thing called a basketball cage, which is a big, huge cement platform outside where we put these big metal cage around it. Uh, so the basketball doesn't go flying off everywhere. It's really cool, and we were building one for our youth center where I was youth pastoring. And we were laying that platform, concrete one day. I had my ring on. Didn't ever take it off. For 
whatever reason, at the end of the day, after we were done building, I'm doing this, and I'm like, that feels funny. It's not there. And my guess is it's somewhere laying in concrete in Grapevine, Texas. I have no idea where it's at. But I just remember that feeling of, ugh. Because I lost something that meant the world to me. Anybody ever lost somebody? I've been walking through these moments in the last few weeks of people in our church who have lost someone. There's nothing more difficult in life than walking through losing someone. It's hard. It's difficult. It takes everything we have. I was talking to Chris even this morning who lost an aunt this week and we're just talking about the emotional drain and, and the physical drain and the mental drain that that takes on, on the, the toll that it takes on people when you lose somebody and it's probably the worst feeling of loss is when we lose someone that we love. Can I tell you this morning that when we walk away from Jesus, that's the way he feels about us. This morning, my goal is to try to personify Jesus in a way that, that we all understand how much the Father loves us and how incredible this saint called grace really is in our lives. When we walk away from Jesus or we walk out of relationship with Jesus or, or we refuse to be in relationship with Jesus, we are, we are all created by Jesus. We are his creation. The Bible says that every one of us as humans, we are the the most beautiful of his creation, and we belong to him. But there comes a point in life when we have to decide to give ourselves to him. And, and if we don't, the Bible says that, that we are lost. And, and Jesus talks about that in this story this morning. And if you have your Bibles in Luke chapter 15, I want to I read a story to you this morning. We know it as the story of the prodigal son. But I want to look at it from a father's perspective this morning. The story talks about a lost son, but, but I really believe that the hero in this story is, is not the son, but it's the dad. They, they could really take this, give it another name, and not call it the story of the prodigal son, but, but they could call it the, the story of the magnificent father. But if, if you have your Bibles, turn there in Luke chapter 15. We'll start reading at verse 11. It says, Jesus continued, said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. And after he had spent everything, he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to his senses, you need to underline that in, in your Bible. When he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, he said, how Many of my father's hired men have food to spare. And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, I love that. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But, but the father said to his servants, Quick, quick, hurry, bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and, 
and let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What a story. What a story. And it's, it's a story that really, really gives a great picture of how grace works in our life. It gives a great picture of how Jesus works in our lives. Jesus is grace. Jesus is grace. But the biggest issue that you find in this story is the simple fact that even though the son had, had, had walked away and the son had gone away and the Bible says that he, he had spent everything that he had. Jesus said that he had squandered his life. He had squandered his savings. He had squandered everything that he had been given. And things were so bad that he went to go work in the fields with the pigs. And he was so hungry that he longed to eat the food that the pigs were eating. Now, any of you farmers, any pig farmers here, it may not be a big deal here, but there's pig farmers in Texas. I don't know if you've ever seen pig feed, but no. No. If they were given samples of pig feed at Costco, I would walk right by. Even if it's free, I ain't trying that. Nasty. Nasty. And this son was longing to eat even the food that the pigs ate, but nobody gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, oh, that's such a powerful statement. When he came to his senses, when he finally realized where he was and the state that he was in, he began to consider going back to his father. And this, this is the deal that's so difficult. And this, this is really what is a great example of us when we begin to think about Jesus. He begins to think, you know what, i got to go back to Dad, but I think I'm going to write a letter or a note to Dad. And I'm going to, you know, Dad, I have failed you. I have failed you. I walked away from you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And I want to stop there for a second. Because this is where we miss it when it comes to Jesus. Do you remember the definition of grace? Unmerited unearned forgiveness. You can't earn it. Better than that, you don't have to earn it. So I say, man, it's free 99. You don't have to earn it. But somewhere in the back of our mind, we have this ideology that says we have to be worthy of it. But can I tell you that you and I do not become children by worth. We become children by birth. We do not become children by worth, but we all become children by birth. I mean, I, I'm not a doctor, but I've been around when my kids were born. I was there in the room, I won't go into detail, some of the craziest things I ever did see in all my life. But if you, if, here's the deal. If you don't believe Jesus is real, just go watch somebody be born. That'll straighten it all out for you. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And no baby sits in that birth canal and does good works in order to become a child. They become a child simply because they're born. And the same thing applies to us as, as followers of Jesus. There's nothing that we can do that will earn us a place in the kingdom. But we only become children of Jesus by birth. By being born again. The Bible says, lest a man be born again, born again, he will not enter the kingdom of heaven. We don't earn our sonship or our daughtership in the kingdom. Jesus freely gives it to us. It's not by worth. It's not what we're worthy of. But it's because we have the opportunity to become born again through the grace of Jesus Christ. We are not saved by worth. Through birth. Let me put it this way. I have three children. 
we talk about grace, and grace can't be earned. I love my children, and there is nothing that they could do. Nothing that they could do that would ever cause me to disown them or to deny them a seat in my family. They can't be good enough to be my children. They don't have to be good enough to be my children. They are my children by birth, and they will always be my children. Now, there are some things I wish they would do better, but that's for another sermon. But even if they did nothing else better, I would love them just the same. Because they are my children. Not by worth, but by birth. And nothing that they do, good or bad, will ever change them. I love them just the same. But we have a hard time with that. We struggle with that fact. But the Bible says that we have to be born again. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. Everybody say, by grace, through faith. By grace, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, but it is a gift of God. Grace is a gift. You don't earn it, you don't buy it. It's a gift that's been freely given by God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. Grace is a free gift. Christmas is coming. You ready for gifts? Somebody say, man. Woo it's the season for giving, not receiving. Man, I like to open presents. It's my favorite time of the year. I love Christmas. And uh, grace is a gift. We don't have to buy it. We don't have to earn it. God gives it freely through his son, Jesus. And it's by grace. Everybody say that, by grace. Okay, through faith. We are saved and brought into relationship with Jesus by grace, through faith. Not by works. Not by works. Not by works. Not by works. So that nobody can boast. The simple fact is all we have to do is believe. But then I get this question all the time. Believe what, Pastor Jimmy? What do I have to believe? Simply this, that Jesus exists. And that he paid for our sins when he died and rose again to give each of us new life. For our relationship and our sonship or daughtership is not based on our performance, but it is based on the finished performance of Jesus in our simple act of believing that he died on the cross. That's it. And I'm looking at you this morning and it's like, you're waiting for the and. But there is no and. The Bible says if you would just believe in Jesus, by grace, through faith. Now let's get back to the story because I want to talk about grace. We've got to hurry because of time, but, but please listen quickly. And remember that Jesus is using this story to illustrate a, a biblical, a kingdom concept or principle about grace. And I want to focus just for a little bit this morning on, on the Father's response because this is how Jesus responds to us when we come to our senses. Some of you this morning, you need to come to your senses. Don't be nudging nobody, just... Some of us this morning, we need to come to our senses. How many ever had to come to your senses more than once? Sometimes stupid's a habit. <laughs> For me, stupid can be a habit. Sometimes I just get dumb because I'm dumb. And more than once a week, I have to come to my senses. So I say amen. Ladies, how many of you would say of your husband, but he has to come to his senses more than once? Men, we're like... We are inherently dumb sometimes. It's just something we men are. And, and our wives, they're wise and they're smart and they're good looking and they're 
hot and forgiving and gracious. Sometimes, men, we're just dumb. I don't have a problem admitting it. I'll be honest with you. And there are some times, Clayton, i got to come to my senses more than once a day. Just, Jimmy, stop doing that. Jimmy, just stop. Come to your senses. I think for a lot of us in our walk, in our relationship, to try to understand grace and try to understand Jesus, we've got to come to our senses more than once. Somebody say amen. I, I know I'm not alone in this boat, but I may be the only one that stands up on the bow and shouts it. I've I got to come to my senses, Imani, like eight or nine times a day. It's just real. But the cool thing about it is, is as real as that is, the grace of Jesus is more real. And that for every time I come to my senses, Jesus responds just like the Father did. And that though we may be far away, we may find ourselves here one day with with Jesus, and all of a sudden we've walked away and we're over here, the Father still loves us. And that moment we come to our senses and say, man, I need to be back with my Father, we turn and we begin to make a motion. And can I tell you the cool thing about the Father in the story, the cool thing about Jesus is that says when the Father noticed the Son from afar off, do you realize that in order for the Father to notice Him, He had to be what? Looking for Him. Oh, He could have been sitting inside in His recliner, chilled back, drinking a stony tango wheezy and watching football on the tube. But He wasn't. He was out looking for His Son. He was anticipating his return. Can I tell you this morning that if you've walked away from Jesus, he's looking for you. He's looking for you this morning. He's longing to see you. And if you'll come to your senses this morning and recognize that grace is free and that it's a gift and you don't have to earn it if you'll turn to him, the Bible says that the father ran to the son. And dads don't run. Let's be honest. Dads don't run. Come on, Kate, tell the truth. Dads don't run, baby. Have you ever watched your father run? Is it not the funniest thing in the world? Here's what happens when I run. When I, when I run in my head, I see me at age 19. Playing football in college, running like a superstar. I mean, I'm... But when my kids see me run, they don't see that. When my kids see me run, it's like, Dad, stop, just walk. Please, just walk, Dad. Dad, don't run. Why? Because dads don't run. Old men don't run. It's one of them things, man. You, you, like, you lose your cool at a certain age. And you go from looking like a superstar to a falling star. Just like that. It's bad. Dads don't run, but, but even in culture back here, in these days, it wasn't like, it wasn't proper for dad to run. Because you're dignified. Not this father. The Bible says when he saw his son, he, he looked at and he began to run to his son. And when, when he got to him, he took his arms and he wrapped him around his son. And the Bible says, this is where it gets kind of weird, he kissed him. Well, my boys hate that. Am I right, Braden? You hate it when I kiss you. But when I come home from a long trip, do I, I just want to kiss my kids. I love my kids. And yesterday when I got home from the Doma, I met them in the living room, put my arms around them, kissed them on the head. And you know, Caitlin, she kind of, it's not like she likes it, but she accepts it. The boys are like, <laughs> they love the hug, but then they're kind of like, good to see you too, Dad. But the Bible says he took his arms and wrapped them around his son and and he hugged him and he kissed him and he celebrated because his son had come home. And his son looks at the father and says, Father, I've sinned against you and against heaven. I'm not worthy to be your son. And and, and the dad goes, Bull, you are worthy to be my son. You're worthy because I love you and you've come home. Forget about what you've done. I don't care. Man, go, go, get the new robe, get the ring, kill the fatted calf, we have a barbecue, baby. It's a Texas party. Fill the grill with meat and let's party. My son has come home. Don't get 
the skinny calf. Get the fat one. Get the best one. Get him a new robe. Put new shoes on his feet. Like nothing ever happened. It's what Jesus does for us when we come. That is grace. It's unmerited. It's unearned. But it's how Jesus feels about us. His love is extravagant. Dads don't run. But Jesus runs. And he hugs us and he kisses us. And he tells us, you don't have to be worthy. I've already made you worthy. My death on the cross, my resurrection, it's made you worthy. Because I love you. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You just have to believe in me. That's grace. Even in our darkest moments, our greatest failures, our lowest point, Jesus loves us. And it's in that moment when we come to our senses and realize our need for him, we're willing to turn to him that he runs to us. And and when we return, he celebrates and he he throws a party for us and he honors us and he gives us the best robe and a ring and, and a feast and celebrates. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about grace. But we go back to that question as I'm closing this morning. What do we do with grace? It's so hard for so many of us. Unfortunately, many of us try to define it in our own terms because it's just too good to be true. And in doing so, we confuse so many people. We try to qualify it by applying rules to it and restrictions and saying that God will only love you, Jesus will only love you if you do this, 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 and this. Jesus will never stop loving you. He may not approve of what you're doing, but he'll never stop loving you. Jesus never leaves us or forsakes us, but we choose to leave him. We act like the son and we walk away from the father. The father didn't leave the son, the son left the father. And when we returned, there had to be a restoration. Father ran in order to restore the son. That's grace. That's grace. But we we mess it up and we try to qualify it by applying rules and restrictions. And, And many of us use it as a platform to sin. I'm not going into this too much this morning, but, but i got to tell you, as we're talking about grace, grace is not a license to do what we want to do. Grace is a gift from Jesus to restore us, to bring us to a place of being in right relationship with Jesus, but it's not a license to live however we want to. With every act of disobedience and every act of sin, we, we seem to take one step away from the Father. And if we're not careful and we don't allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us in our walk with with Jesus and to guide us and to lead us, we we just take one step after another. But if daily, this is where I'm telling you, if daily we just come to our senses and realize we need to stay with the Father. Jesus doesn't ever turn his back on us. He doesn't ever say, hey, one more time, I'm done with you. what he does he says I love you I know you've walked away from me 799 times but I love you why because of grace but it's not a license to live the way we think we want to live it's not a license to sin but we do all this because we we fail to realize that grace isn't a thing. Grace is a person. Jesus is grace. And to be saved by grace is to be saved by Jesus. If we would stop trying to qualify and to quantify this thing called grace and realize that grace is a person, we will never want to fall away 
from grace. Jesus is grace. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1. This is my second closing. John chapter 1 this morning. I just want to read a passage of scripture to you. Verses 14 through 17 says, John testifies concerning him, concerning Jesus. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. And from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Oh man, if that's you, say amen. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth, hold on to that, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, who has made him known. Jesus personifies grace and truth. Grace and truth. You see, the grace of Jesus completed the law of Moses. It's not that the law was unnecessary, and it's not that rules and regulations don't apply, but the reality is we don't get to heaven through the law. We get to heaven through Jesus. What the law was unable to do, Jesus did on the cross by grace. Because of his love and his grace, All we have to have is faith to believe that he is who he says he is. And if we'll surrender to him, the Bible says we'll have eternal life. Rules are good and they have their place. But ultimately, the law isn't how we get to God. But it's through Jesus. Jesus is grace. Now, now I know there's some of you out there saying, Pastor Jim, you're stepping over line. You're just talking about grace. Grace, grace, grace. You make this too easy. What about sin? What about those people that are sinning and still coming to church? I tell you, there's sin in the church. Somebody say amen. There's sin in this church. I won't get too deep into that, but there's sin in this church. There are people in this church, in this service right now, you're living in sin, and you know it. I know, everybody thought this was like an easy, cool message, right? Grace, grace, grace. Pastor Jimmy's all grace. It's all awesome. But some of you are worried because all he's doing is talking about grace. People are going to think they can do whatever they want, and there's just grace. Well, here's the deal. Once we're saved by grace, and we truly embrace this person of Jesus, if we truly embrace Jesus and we fall in love with him, you will not want to sin. The problem with sin is we just love ourselves more than we love Jesus. That's why we sin. Let's just be honest. But if we love our Father, if we love Jesus, we'll live our lives to please Jesus. Once we realize grace is not a thing to be earned, but it's a person to be loved and to be loved by, why in the world would you ever want to turn away from someone who loves you more than anybody else in this world? See, so many of us try so hard to earn love, that's why we're willing to sin. That's why we're willing to fall away and do things we wouldn't normally do because we're trying to earn love from somebody. We're trying to earn love and attention from somebody. I just want to be loved, but what we fail to realize is that Jesus loves you more than anybody else will ever love you. And you don't have to earn it, and you don't have to perform it, and you don't have to do things you wouldn't normally do because Jesus loves you already. Before we get too haughty in the church and think of ourselves more highly than we should, we must realize that people don't need grace to sin. People need grace to deal with the sin that they've already committed. That's why Jesus died on the cross. And today, that grace is here. Jesus is here. And that grace is here for you. 
that grace is here for me. And you don't have to earn it. But just as the Father did to the Son, He looks at you today and says, I love you. If you'll come to your senses. If you'll come to your senses. I will wrap my arms around you. I will love you. 